Good evening, Douglas Gwillem here. So you've tuned in for the evening weird, for the weirding hour. Well, welcome. I wonder, I wonder just if this is the one you've been waiting for. I wonder if in the back of your mind, Lo, these weeks of the weird, through the borderlands and the vegetable mans, you have wanted just this. Have you been waiting? Waiting for something in particular? Oh, ye fans of the early weird. Oh, <laughs> ye fans of True Detective. Tonight is the night. The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers, 1895. The King in Yellow is dedicated to my brother. Along the shore, the cloud waves break. The twin suns sink beneath the lake. The shadows lengthen in Carcosa. Strange is the night where black stars rise and strange moons circle through the skies, but stranger still is lost Carcosa. Songs that the Hyades shall sing where flap the tatters of the king must die unheard in dim Carcosa. Song of my soul, my voice is dead. Die thou unsung as tears unshed shall dry and die in lost Carcosa. Casilda's song in the King in Yellow, Act One, Scene Two. The Repairer of Reputations. One. Ne rayons pas les fous. Leur folie dure plus longtemps que la nôtre. Voilà toute la différence. Toward the end of the year 1920, the government of the United States had practically completed the program adopted during the last months of President Winthrop's administra administration. The country was apparently tranquil. Everybody knows how the tariff and labor questions were settled. The war with Germany, incident on that country's seizure of the Samoan Islands, had left no visible scars upon the Republic, and the temporary occupation of Norfolk by the invading army had been forgotten in the joy over repeated naval victories. And the subsequent ridiculous plight of General von Gartenlaub's forces in the state of New Jersey. The Cuban and Hawaiian investments had paid 100%, and the territory of Samoa was well worth its cost as a coaling station. The country was in a superb state of defense. Every coast city had been well supplied with land fortifications, the army, under the parental eye of the general staff, organized according to the Prussian system, had been increased to 300,000 men, with a territorial reserve of a million. And six magnificent squadrons of cruisers and battleships patrolled the six stations of the navigable seas, leaving a steam reserve amply fitted to control home waters. The gentlemen from the West had at last been constrained to acknowledge that a college for the training of diplomats was as necessary as law schools are for the training of barristers. Consequently, we were no longer represented abroad by incompetent patriots. The nation was prosperous. Chicago, for a moment paralyzed after a second great fire, had risen from its ruins, white and imperial, and more beautiful than the white city which had been built for its plaything in 1893. Everywhere, good architecture was replacing bad, and even in New York, a sudden craving for decency had swept away a great portion of the existing horrors. Streets had been widened, properly paved and lighted, trees had been planted, squares laid out, elevated structures demolished and underground roads built to replace them. 
The new government buildings and barracks were fine bits of architecture, and the long system of stone quays which completely surrounded the island had been turned into parks which proved a godsend to the population. The subsidizing of the state theater and state opera brought its own reward. The United States National Academy of Design was much like European institutions of the same kind. Nobody envied the Secretary of Fine Arts, either his cabinet position or his portfolio. The Secretary of Forestry and Game Preservation had a much easier time, thanks to the new system of National Mounted Police. We had profited well by the latest treaties with France and England. The checking of immigration, the new laws concerning naturalization, and the gradual centralization of power in the executive all contributed to national calm and prosperity. The nation drew a long sigh of relief. When, after the colossal Congress of Religions, bigotry and intolerance were laid in their graves and kindness and charity began to draw warring sects together, many thought the millennium had arrived, at least in the new world which, after all, is a world by itself. But self-preservation is the first law and the United States had to look on in helpless sorrow as Germany, Italy, Spain, and Belgium writhed in the throes of anarchy, while Russia, watching from the Caucasus, uh, stooped and bound them one by one. In the city of New York, the summer of 1899 was signalized by the dismantling of the elevated railroads. The summer of 1900 will live in the memories of New York people for many a cycle, the Dodge statue was removed in that year. In the following winter began that agitation for the repeal of the laws prohibiting suicide, which bore its final fruit in the month of April 1920, when the first government lethal chamber was opened on Washington Square. I had walked down that day from Dr. Archer's house on Madison Avenue, where I had been as a mere formality. Ever since that fall from my horse, four years before, I'd been troubled at times with pains in the back of my head and neck. But now, for months, they had been absent, and the doctor sent me away that day, saying there was nothing more to be cured in me. It was hardly worth his fee to be told that. I knew it myself. Still, I did not grudge him the money. What I minded was the mistake which he made at first. When they picked me up from the pavement where I lay unconscious, and somebody had mercifully sent a bullet through my horse's head, I was carried to Dr. Archer, and he, pronouncing my brain affected, placed me in his private asylum where I was obliged to endure treatment for insanity. At last he decided that I was well, and I, knowing that my mind had always been as sound as his, if not sounder, paid my tuition, as he jokingly called it, and left. I told him, smiling, that I would get even with him for his mistake, and he laughed heartily and asked me to call once in a while. I did so, hoping for a chance to even up accounts, but he gave me none, and I told him I would wait. The fall from my horse had fortunately left no evil results. On the contrary, it had changed my whole character for the better. From a lazy young man about town, I had become active, energetic, temperate, and above all, oh, above all else, ambitious. There was only one thing which troubled me. I laughed at my own uneasiness, and yet it troubled me. During my convalescence, I had bought and read, for the first time, The King in Yellow. I remember, after finishing the first act, that it occurred to me that I had better stop. I started up and flung the book into the fireplace. The volume struck the barred grate and fell open on the hearth in the firelight. If I had not caught a glimpse of the opening words in the second act, I should never have finished it. But as I stooped to pick it up, my eyes became riveted to the open page, and with a cry of terror, or perhaps it was of joy so poignant that I suffered in every nerve, I snatched the thing out of the coals and crept shaking to my bedroom where I read it, and reread it, and wept, and laughed, and trembled with a horror which at times assails me yet. 
This is the thing that troubles me, for I cannot forget Carcosa, where black stars hang in the heavens, where the shadows of men's thoughts lengthen in the afternoon, where the twin suns sink into the lake of Hali, and my mind will bear forever the memory of the pallid mask. I pray God will curse the writer, as the writer has cursed the world with his, this beautiful, stupendous creation, terrible in its simplicity, irresistible in its truth, a world which now trembles before the king in yellow. When the French government seized the translated copies which had just arrived in Paris, London, of course, became eager to read it. It is well known how the book spread like an infectious disease from city to city, from continent to continent, barred out here, confiscated there, denounced by press and pulpit, censured even by the most advanced of literary anarchists. No definite principles had been violated in those wicked pages, no doctrine promulgated, no convictions outraged. It could not be judged by any known standard, yet although it was acknowledged that the supreme note of art had been struck in the king in yellow, all felt that human nature could not bear the strain, nor thrive on words in which the essence of purest poison lurked. The very banality and innocence of the first act only allowed the blow to fall afterward with more awful effect. It was, I remember, the 13th day of April, 1920, that the first government lethal chamber was established on the south side of Washington Square between Worcester Street and South Fifth Avenue. The block, which had formerly consisted of a lot of shabby old buildings, used as cafes and restaurants for foreigners, had been acquired by the government in the winter of 1898. The French and Italian cafes and restaurants were torn down. The whole block was enclosed by a gilded iron railing and converted into a lovely garden with lawns, flowers, and fountains. In the center of the garden stood a small white building, severely classical in architecture and surrounded by thickets of flowers. Six ionic columns supported the roof, and the single door was of bronze. A splendid marble group of the fates stood before the door, the work of a young American sculptor, Boris Yvain, who had died in Paris when only 23 years old. The inauguration ceremonies were in progress as I crossed U University Place and entered the square. I threaded my way through the silent throng of spectators, but was stopped at 4th Street by, by a cordon of police. A regiment of United States Lancers were drawn up in a hollow square around the lethal chamber. On a raised tribune facing Washington Park stood the governor of New York, and behind him were grouped the mayor of New York and Brooklyn, the inspector general of police, the commandant of the state troops, Colonel Livingston, military aide to the President of the United States, General Blount, commanding at Governor's Island, Major General Hamilton, commanding the garrison of New York and Brooklyn, Admiral Buffby of the fleet in the North River, Surgeon General Lansford of the staff of the National Free Hospital, Senators Wise and Franklin of New York, and the Commissioner of Public Works. The Tribune was surrounded by a squadron of hussars of the National Guard. The governor was finishing his reply to the short speech of the Surgeon General. I heard him say, The laws prohibiting suicide and providing punishment for any attempt at self-destruction have been repealed. The government has seen fit to acknowledge the right of man to end an existence which may have become intolerable to him through physical suffering or mental despair. It is believed that the community will be benefited by the removal of such people from their midst. Since the passage of this law, the number of suicides in the United States has not increased. Now the government has determined to establish a lethal chamber in every city, town, and village in the country. It remains to be seen whether or not that class of human creatures from whose desponding ranks new victims of self-destruction fall daily will accept the relief thus provided. He paused and turned to the white lethal chamber. The silence in the street was absolute. 
There a painless death awaits him who can no longer bear the sorrows of this life. If death is welcome, let him seek it there. Then, quickly turning to the military aide of the president's household, he said, I declare the lethal chambers open. And again, facing the vast crowd, he cried in a clear voice, Citizens of New York and of the United States of America, through me the government declares the lethal chamber to be open. The solemn hush was broken by a sharp cry of command. The squadron of hussars filled, filed after the governor's carriage. The lancers wheeled and formed along Fifth Avenue to wait for the commandant of the garrison, and the mounted police followed them. I left the crowd to gape and stare at the white marble death chamber, and crossing South Fifth Avenue, walked along the western side of that thoroughfare to Bleecker Street. Then I turned to the right and stopped before a dingy shop which bore the sign, Hauberk Armorer. I glanced in at the doorway and saw Hauberk busy in his little shop at the end of the hall. He looked up and, catching sight of me, cried in his deep, hearty voice, Come in, Mr. Castain. Constance, his daughter, rose to meet me as I crossed the threshold and held out her pretty hand. But I saw the blush of disappointment on her cheeks and knew that it was another Castaigne she had expected, my cousin Louis. I smiled at her confusion and com complimented her on the banner she was embroidering from a colored plate. Old Hauberk sat riveting the worn greaves of some ancient suit of armor, and the ting-ting-ting of his little hammer sounded pleasantly in the quaint shop. Presently he dropped his hammer and fussed about for a moment with a tiny wrench. The soft clash of the mail sent a thrill of pleasure through me. I, I loved to hear the music of steel brushing against steel, the mellow shock of the mallet on thigh pieces, and the jingle of chain armor. That was the only reason I went to see Hauberk. He had never interested me personally, nor did Constance, except for the fact of her being in love with Louis. This did occupy my attention, and sometimes even kept me awake at night. But I knew in my heart that all would come right, and that I should arrange their future as I expected to arrange that of my kind doctor, John Archer. However, I should never have troubled myself about visiting them just then, had it not been, as I say, that the music of the tinkling hammer had for me this strong fascination. I would sit for hours, listening and listening, and when a stray sunbeam struck the inlaid steel, the sensation it gave me was almost too keen to endure. My eyes would become fixed, dilating with a pleasure that stretched every nerve almost to breaking until some movement of the old armorer cut off the ray of sunlight. Then, still thrilling secretly, I leaned back and listened again to the sound of the polishing rag, swish, swish, rubbing rust from the rivets. Constance worked with the embroidery over her knees, now and then pausing to examine more closely the pattern in the colored plate from the Metropolitan Museum. Who is this for? I asked. Hauberk explained that in addition to the treasures of armor in the Metropolitan Museum, of which he had been appointed armorer, he also had charge of several collections belonging to rich amateurs. This was the missing greave of a famous suit which a client of his had traced to a little shop in Paris on the Quai d'Orsay. He, Hauberk, had negotiated for and secured the greave, and now the suit was complete. He laid down his hammer and read me the history of the suit, traced since 1450 from owner to owner until it was acquired by Thomas Stainbridge. When his superb collection was sold, this client of Hauberk's bought the suit, and since then the search for the missing grieve had been pushed until it was, almost by accident, located in Paris. Did you continue the search so persistently without any certainty of the grieve being still in existence, I demanded? Of course, he replied coolly. Then, for the first time, I took a personal interest in Hauberk. It was worth something to you, I ventured. No, he replied, laughing. My pleasure in finding it was my reward. Have you no ambition to be rich, I asked, smiling. My one ambition is to be the best armorer in the world, he answered gravely.
Constance asked me if I had seen the ceremonies at the lethal chamber. She herself had noticed cavalry passing up Broadway that morning and had wished to see the inauguration. But her father wanted the banner finished, and she had stayed at his request. "'Did you see your cousin, M Mr. Castain, there?' she asked, with the slightest tremor of her soft eyelashes. "'No,' I replied carelessly. "'Louise's regiment is maneuvering out in Westchester County.' I rose and picked up my hat and cane. "'Are you going upstairs to see the lunatic again?' laughed old Hauberk. If Hauberk knew how I loathe that word lunatic, he would never use it in my presence. It rouses certain feelings within me which I do not care to explain. However, I answered him quietly. I think I shall drop in and see Mr. Wilde for a moment or two. Poor fellow, said Constance with a shake of her head. It must be hard to live alone year after year, poor, crippled, and almost demented. It is very good of you, Mr. Castain, to visit him as often as you do. I think he is vicious, observed Hauberk, beginning again with his hammer. I listened to the golden tinkle on the grieve plates. When he had finished, I replied, No, he is not vicious, nor is he in the least demented. His mind is a wonder chamber from which he can extract treasures that you and I would give years of our life to acquire. Hauberk laughed. I continued a little impatiently. He knows history as no one else could know it. N nothing, however trivial, escapes his search, and his memory is so absolute, so precise in details, that were it known in New York that such a man existed, the people could not honor him enough. Nonsense, muttered Hauberk, searching on the floor for a fallen rivet. Is it nonsense, I asked, managing to suppress what I felt. Is it nonsense when he says that the tacits and cuissards, cuissards of the enameled suit of armor, commonly known as the princes emblazoned, can be found among a mass of rusty theatrical properties, broken stoves and rag pickers refuse in a garret in Pell Street? Hauberk's hammer fell to the ground. But he picked it up and asked, with a great deal of calm, how I knew that the tacits and left Quizard were missing from the prince's emblazoned. I did not know until Mr. Wilde mentioned it to me the other day. He said they were in the garret of 998 Pell Street. Is this uh, nonsense, he cried, but I noticed his hand trembling under his leathern apron. Is this nonsense too, I asked pleasantly. Is it nonsense when Mr. Wilde continually speaks of you as the Marquis of Avonshire and Miss Constance... I did not finish, for Constance had started to her feet with terror written on every feature. Hauberk looked at me and slowly smoothed his leathern apron. That is impossible, he observed. Mr. Wilde may know a great many things. About armor, for instance, and, and the princes emblazoned, I interposed, smiling. Yes, he continued slowly. About armor also, maybe, but... He is wrong in regard to the Marquis of Avonshire, who, as you know, killed his wife's traducer years ago and went to Australia, where he did not long survive his wife. Mr. Wilde is wrong, murmured Constance. Her lips were blanched, but her voice was sweet and calm. Let us agree, if you please, that in this one circumstance, Mr. Wilde is wrong, I said. I climbed the three dilapidated flights of stairs, which I had so often climbed before, and knocked at a small door at the end of the corridor. Mr. Wilde opened the door, and I walked in. When he had double-locked the door and pushed a heavy chest against it, he came and sat down beside me, peering up into my face with his little light-colored eyes. Half a dozen new scratches covered his nose and cheeks, and the silver wires which supported his artificial ears had become displaced. I thought I had never seen him so hideously fascinating. He had no ears. The artificial ones, which now stood out at an angle from the fine wire, were his one weakness. They were made of wax and painted a shell pink, but the rest of his face was yellow. 
he might better have reveled in the luxury of some artificial fingers for his left hand, which was absolutely fingerless. But it seemed to cause him no inconvenience, and he was satisfied with his wax ears. He was very small, scarcely higher than a child of ten, but his arms were magnificently developed, and his thighs as thick as any athlete's. Still, the most remarkable thing about Mr. Wilde was that a man of his marvelous intelligence and knowledge should have such a head. It was flat and pointed like the heads of many whose many of those unfortunates whom people imprison in asylums for the weak-minded. Many called him insane, but I knew him to be as sane as I was. I do not deny that he was an eccentric. The mania he had for keeping that cat and teasing her until she flew at his face like a demon was certainly eccentric. I never could understand why he kept the creature, nor what pleasure he found in shutting himself up in his room with this surly, vicious beast. I, I remember once glancing up from the manuscript I was studying by the light of some tallow dips and seeing Mr. Wilde squatting motionless on his high chair, his eyes fairly blazing with excitement, while the cat, which had risen from her place before the stove, came creeping across the floor right at him. Before I could move, she flattened her belly, belly to the ground, crouched, trembled, and sprang into his face. Howling and foaming, they rolled over and over on the floor, scratching and clawing until the cat screamed and fled under the cabinet. And Mr. Wilde turned over on his back, his limbs contracting and curling up like the legs of a dying spider. He was eccentric. Mr. Wilde had climbed into his high chair and, after studying my face, picked up a dog's-eared ledger and opened it. Henry B. Matthews, he read, bookkeeper with Wysot, Wysot and Company, dealers in church ornaments, called April 3rd. Reputation damaged on the racetrack, known as a welcher. Reputation to be repaired by August 1st, retainer $5. He turned the page and ran his fingerless knuckles down the closely written columns. P. Green Dusenberry, Minister of the Gospel, Fair Beach, New Jersey, reputation damaged in the Bowery. To be repaired as soon as possible, retainer $100. He coughed and added, called April 6th. Then you are not in need of money, Mr. Wilde, I inquired. Listen, he coughed again. Mrs. C. Hamilton Chester of Chester Park, New York City, called April 7th. Reputation damaged at Dieppe, France. To be repaired by October 1st, retainer $500. Note. C. Hamilton Chester, Captain USS Avalanche, ordered home from South Sea Squadron October 1st. Well, I said, the profession of a repairer of reputations is lucrative. His colorless eyes sought mine. I only wanted to demonstrate that I was correct. You said it was impossible to succeed as a repairer of reputations, that even if I did succeed in certain cases, it would cost me more than... I would gain by it. Today I have 500 men in my employ, who are poorly paid, but who pursue the work with an enthusiasm which possibly may be born of fear. These men enter every shade and grade of society. Some even are pillars of the most exclusive social temples. Others are the prop and pride of the financial world. Still others hold undisputed sway among the fancy and the talent. I choose them at my leisure from those who reply to my adver advertisements. It is easy enough. They are all cowards. I could tremble. I could treble the number of number in twenty days if I wished. So you see, those who have in their keeping the reputations of their fellow citizens, I have in my pay. They may turn on you. I suggested. He rubbed his thumb over his cropped ears and adjusted the wax substitutes. I think not, he murmured thoughtfully. I seldom have to apply the whip, and then only once. Besides, they like their wages. How do you apply the whip, I demanded. His face for a moment was awful to look upon. His eyes dwindled to a pair of green sparks. I invite them to come and have a little chat with me, he said in a soft voice. A knock at the door interrupted him, and his face resumed its amiable expression. Who is it? he inquired. 
Mr. Stylette was the answer. Come tomorrow, replied Mr. Wilde. Impossible, began the other, but was silenced by a sort of bark from Mr. Wilde. Come tomorrow, he repeated. We heard somebody move away from the door and turn the corner by the stairway. Who is that? I asked. Arnold Stylett, owner and editor-in-chief of the great New York Daily. He drummed on the ledger with his fingerless hand, adding, I pay him very badly, but he thinks it a good bargain. Arnold Stylett? I, I repeated, amazed. Yes, said Mr. Wilde with a self-satisfied cough. The cat, which had entered the room as he spoke, hesitated, looked up at him and snarled. He climbed down from the chair and, squatting on the floor, took the creature into his arms and caressed her. The cat ceased snarling and presently began a loud purring, which seemed to increase in timbre as he stroked her. Where are the notes? I asked. He pointed to the table, and for the hundredth time I picked up the bundle of manuscript entitled The Imperial Dynasty of America. One by one I studied the well-worn pages, worn only by my own handling, and although I knew all by heart from the beginning, when from Carcosa, the Hyades, Hastur, and, and Aldebaran, to Castaigne, Louis de Calve Calvados, born December 19th, 1877, I read it with an eager, rapt attention, pausing to repeat parts of it aloud and dwelling especially on Hildred de Caval Calva Calvados, only son of Hildred de Castaigne and Edith Landis Castaigne, first in succession, etc., etc. When I finished, Mr. Wilde nodded and coughed. Speaking of your legitimate ambition, he said, how do Constance and Louis get along? She loves him, I replied simply. The cat on his knee suddenly turned and struck at his eyes, and he flung her off and climbed onto the chair opposite me. And Dr. Archer? But that's a matter you can settle any time you wish, he added. Yes, I replied, Dr. Archer can wait, but it is time I saw my cousin Louis. It is time, he replied, he repeated. Then he took another ledger from the table and ran over the leaves rapidly. We are now in communication with 10,000 men, he muttered. We can count on 100,000 within the first 28 hours, and in 48 hours the state will rise en masse. The country follows the state and the portion that will not, I, I mean California and the northeast, northwest, might better never have been inhabited. I shall not send them the yellow sign. The blood rushed to my head, but I only answered, uh, A new broom sweeps clean. The ambition of Caesar and of Napoleon pales before that which could not rest until it had seized the minds of men and controlled even their unborn thoughts, said Mr. Wilde. You are speaking of the king in yellow, I groaned with a shudder. He is a king whom emperors have served. I, I am content to serve him, I replied. Mr. Wilde sat rubbing his ears with his crippled hand. Perhaps Constance does not love him, he suggested. I started to reply, but a sudden burst of military music from the street below drowned my voice. The 20th Dragoon Regiment, uh, formerly in garrison at Mount St. Vincent, was returning from the maneuvers in Westchester County to its new barracks on East Washington Square. It was my cousin's regiment. They were a fine lot of fellows in their pale blue, tight-fitting jackets, jaunty busby, busbies and white riding breeches with the double yellow stripe into which their limbs seemed molded. Every other squadron was armed with lances, from the metal points of which fluttered yellow and white pennons. The band passed, playing the regiment march. Then came the colonel and staff, the horses crowding and trampling while their heads bobbed in unison and the pennons fluttered from their lance points. The troopers, who rode with the beautiful English seat, looked brown as berries from their bloodless campaign among the farms of Westchester, and the music of their sabers against the stirrups and the stirrups and the jingle of spurs and carbines was delightful to me. I saw Louis riding with his squadron. He was as handsome an officer as I have ever seen. Mr. Wilde, who had mounted a chair by the window, saw him too, but said nothing. 
Louis turned and looked straight at Hauberk's shop as he passed, and I could see the flush on his brown cheeks. I think Constance must have been at the window. When the last troopers had clattered by and the last pennons van vanished into South Fifth Avenue, Mr. Wilde clambered out of his chair and dragged the chest away from the door. Yes, he said, it is time that you saw your cousin Louis. He unlocked the door and I picked up my hat and stick and stepped into the corridor. The stairs were dark. Groping about, I set my foot on something soft, which snarled and spit, and I aimed a murderous blow at the cat, but my cane shivered to splinters against the balustrade, and the beast scurried back into Mr. Wilde's room. Passing Hauberk's door again, I saw him still at work on the armor. But I did not stop, and stepping out into Bleecker Street, I followed it to Worcester, skirted the grounds of the lethal chamber, and crossing Washington Park, went straight to my rooms in the Benedict. Here I, lun I lunched comfortably, read the Herald and the Meteor, and finally went to the steel safe in my bedroom and set the time com combination. The three and three-quarter minutes which it is necessary to wait while the time lock is opening are to me golden moments. From the instant I set the combination to the moment when I grasp the knobs and swing back the solid steel doors, I live in an ecstasy of expectation. Those moments must be like moments passed in paradise. I know what I am to find at the end of the time limit. I know what the massive safe holds secure for me, for me alone, and the exquisite pleasure of waiting is hardly enhanced when the safe opens and I lift from its velvet crown a diadem of purest gold blazing with diamonds. I do this every day, and yet the joy of waiting and at last touching again the diadem only seems to increase as the days pass. It is a diadem fit for a king among kings, an emperor among emperors. The king in yellow might scorn it, but it shall be worn by his royal servant. I held it in my arms until the alarm in the safe rang harshly, and then tenderly, Proudly, I replaced it and shut the steel doors. I walked slowly back into my study, which faces Washington Square, and leaned on the window sill. The afternoon sun poured into my windows, and a gentle breeze stirred the branches of the elms and maples in the park, now covered with buds and tender foliage. A flock of pigeons circled about the tower of the memorial church, sometimes alighting on the purple-tiled roof, sometimes wheeling downward to the lotos fountain in front of the marble arch. The gardeners were busy with the flower beds around the fountain, and the freshly turned earth smelled sweet and spicy. A lawnmower, drawn by a fat white horse, clinked across the green sward, and the watering carts poured showers of spray over the asphalt drives. Around the statue of Peter's Stuyvesant, which in 1897 had replaced the monstrosity supposed to represent Garibaldi, children played in the spring sunshine. Nurse girls wheeled elaborate baby carriages with a reckless disregard for the pasty-faced occupants, which could probably be explained by the presence of half a dozen trim dragoon troopers languidly lolling on the, on the benches. Through the trees, the Washington Memorial Arch glistened like silver in the sunshine. And beyond, on the eastern extremity of the square, are the gray stone barracks of the dragoons, and the white granite artillery stables were alive with color and motion. I looked at the lethal chambers on the corner of the square opposite. A few curious people still lingered about the gilded iron railings, but inside the grounds the paths were deserted. I watched the fountains ripple and sparkle, the sparrows had already found this new bathing nook, and the basins were covered with the dusty feathered little things. Two or three white peacocks picked their way across the lawns, and a drab-colored pigeon sat so motionless on the arm of one of the fates that it seemed to be a part of the sculptured stone. As I was turning careful, carelessly away, a slight commotion in the group of curious loiterers around the gates attracted my attention. A young man had entered and was advancing with nervous strides along the gravel path which leads to the bronze doors of the lethal chamber. He paused a moment before the fates, and as he raised his head to those three mysterious faces, the pigeon rose from its sculptured 
Perch circled about for a moment and wheeled to the east. The young man pressed his hand to his face and then, with an undefinable gesture, sprang up the marble steps. The bronze doors closed behind him, and half an hour later the loiterers slouched away, and the frightened pigeon returned to its perch in the arms of fate. I put on my hat and went out into the park for a little walk before dinner. As I crossed the central driveway, a group of officers passed, and one of them called out, Hello, Hildred, and came back to shake hands with me. It was my cousin Louis, who stood smiling and tapping his spurred heels with his riding whip. Just back from Westchester, he said. I've been doing the bucolic, uh, milk and curds, you know, and dairy maids in sunbonnets who say, hey ow, and I don't think, when you tell them they are pretty. I I'm nearly dead for a square meal at, at Delmonico's. What's the news? There is none, I replied pleasantly. I, I, I saw your regiment coming in this morning. Did you? I, I didn't see you. Uh, where were you? In Mr. Wilde's window. Oh, hell, he began impatiently. That man is stark mad. I, I don't understand why you... He saw how annoyed I felt by this outburst and begged my pardon. Really, old chap, he said. I don't mean to run down a man you like. But for the life of me, I can't see what the deuce you find in common with Mr. Wilde. He's, he's not well-bred, to put it generously. He is hideously deformed. His head is the head of a criminally insane person. You know yourself he's been in an asylum. So have I, I interrupted calmly. Louis looked startled and confused for a moment, but recovered and slapped me heartily on the shoulder. You were completely cured, he began, but I stopped him again. I suppose you mean that I was simply acknowledged never to have been insane? Of course, that, that, that's what I meant, he laughed. I disliked his laugh because I knew it was forced, but I nodded gaily and asked him where he was going. Louis looked after his brother officers, who had now almost reached Broadway. We'd intended to sample a Brunswick cocktail, but to tell you the truth, I was anxious for an excuse to go and see Hauberk instead. Come along. I'll make you. I'll make you my excuse. We found old Hauberk, neatly attired in a fresh spring suit, standing at the door of his shop and sniffing the air. I had just decided to take Constance for a little stroll before dinner. He replied to the impetuous volley of questions from Louis. We thought of walking on the park terrace along the North River. At that moment, Constance appeared and grew pale and rosy by turns as Louis bent over her small gloved fingers. I tried to excuse myself, alleging an engagement uptown, but Louis and Constance would not listen, and I saw I was expected to remain and engage old Hauberk's attention. After all, it would be just as well if I kept my eye on Louis, I thought, and when they hailed a Spring Street horse car, I got in after them and took my seat beside the armorer. The beautiful line of parks and granite terraces overlooking the wharves along the North River, which were built in 1910 and finished in the autumn of 1917, had become one of the most popular promenades in the metropolis. They extended from the Battery to 190th Street, overlooking the noble river and affording a fine view of the Jersey Shore and the highlands opposite. Cafes and restaurants were scattered here and there among the trees, and twice a week military bands from the garrison played in the kiosks on the parapets. We sat down in the sunshine on the bench at the foot of the equestrian statue of General Sheridan. Constance tipped her sunshade to shield her eyes, and she and Louis began a murmuring conversation which was impossible to catch. Old Hauberk, leaning on his ivory-headed cane, lighted an excellent cigar, the mate to which I politely refused, and smiled at vac vacancy. The sun hung low above the Staten Island woods, and the bay was dyed with golden hues reflected from the sun-warmed sails of the shipping in the harbor. Brigs, schooners, yachts, clumsy ferryboats, their decks swarming with people, Railroad transports carrying lines of brown, blue, and white freight cars, stately sound steamers, de classe, tramp steamers, coasters, dredgers, scows, and everywhere pervading the entire bay, impudent little tugs, puffing and whistling officiously. These were the craft which churned the sunlight waters as far as the eye could reach. In calm contrast to the hurry of sailing vessel and steamer, 
A silent fleet of white warships lay motionless in midstream. Constance's merry laugh aroused me from my reverie. What are you staring at? she inquired. Nothing. Uh, the fleet, I smiled. Then Louis told us what the vessels were, pointing out each by its relative position to the old red fort on Governor's Island. That little cigar-shaped thing is a torpedo boat, he explained. There are four more lying close together. They are the tarpon, the falcon, the sea fox, and the octopus. The gunboats just above are the Princeton, the, Ch the Champlain, the Stillwater, and the Erie. Next to them lie the cruisers Farragut and Los Angeles, and above them the battleships California and Dakota, and the Washington, which is the flagship. Those two squatty-looking chunks of metal which are anchored there off Castle William are the double-turreted monitors, terrible and magnificent. Behind them lies the ram Osceola. Constance looked at him with deep approval in her beautiful eyes. What loads of things you know for a soldier, she said, and we all joined in the laugh which followed. Presently, Louis rose with a nod to us and offered his arm to Constance, and they strolled away along the river wall. Hauberk watched them for a moment and then turned to me. Mr. Wilde was right, he said. I've found the missing tacits and left Quizard of the princes emblazoned in a vile old junk garret in Pell Street. 998, I inquired with a smile. Yes. Mr. Wilde is a very intelligent man, I observed. I want to give him the credit of this most important discovery, continued Hauberk and I intend it shall be known that he is entitled to the fame of it. He won't thank you for that, I answered sharply. Please say nothing about it. Do you know what it is worth, said Haber? No, fifty dollars, perhaps? It is valued at five hundred, but the owner of the prince's emblazoned will give two thousand dollars to the person who completes, this, completes his suit. That reward also belongs to Mr. Wilde. He doesn't want it. He refuses it, I answered angrily. What do you know about Mr. Wilde? He doesn't need the money. He's rich, or, or will be, or richer than any living man except myself. What will we care for money then? What will we care, he and I, when... When... When what? demanded Hauberk, astonished. You will see, I replied on my guard again. He looked at me narrowly much as Dr. Archer used to, and I knew he thought I was mentally unsound. Perhaps it was fortunate for him that he did not use the word lunatic just then. No, I replied to his unspoken thought, I am not mentally weak. My mind is as healthy as Mr. Wilde's. I do not care to explain just yet what I have on hand, but it is an investment which will pay more than mere gold, silver, and precious stones. It will secure the happiness and prosperity of a, a continent. Yes, a, a hemisphere. Oh, said Hauberk. And eventually, I continued more quietly, it will secure the happiness of the whole world. And incidentally, your own happiness and prosperity as well as Mr. Wilde's? Exactly, I smiled. But I could have throttled him for taking that tone. He looked at me in silence for a while and then said very gently, why don't you give up your books and studies, Mr. Castain, and take a tramp among the mountains, somewhere or other? You used to be fond of fishing. Take a cast or two at the, at the trout in, in the Wranglies. I, I don't care for fishing any more, I answered, without a shade of annoyance in my voice. You used to be fond of everything, he continued. Athletics, yachting, shooting, riding. I've never cared to ride since my fall, I said quietly. Ah, yes, your fall, he repeated, looking away from me. I thought this nonsense had gone far enough, so I brought the conversation back to Mr. Wilde. But he was scanning my face again in a manner highly offensive to me. Mr. Wilde, he repeated, do you know what he did this afternoon? He came downstairs and nailed a sign over the hall door next to mine. It read, Mr. Wilde, Repairer of Reputations, Third Bell. Do you know what a repairer of reputations can be? I do, I replied, suppressing the rage within. Oh, he said again. Louis and Constance came strolling by and stopped to ask if we would join them. Hauberk looked at his watch. 
At the same moment, a puff of smoke shot from the case, casemates of Castle William, and the boom of the sunset gun rolled across the water and was re-echoed from the highlands opposite. The flag came running down from the flagpole. The bugles sounded on the white decks of the warships, and the first electric light sparkled out from the Jersey shore. As I turned into the city with Hauberk, I heard Constance murmur something to Louis which I did not understand, but Louis whispered, My darling, in reply. And again, walking ahead with Hauberk through the square, I heard a murmur, murmur of, Sweetheart, and my own Constance. And I knew the time had nearly arrived when I should speak of important matters with my cousin Louis. Thanks for joining me for our weirding hour of 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Come around tomorrow night for our second installment of the much celebrated proto weird tale, The King in Yellow. Robert W. Chambers. Hope you're well. Stay well. Be kind to one another. Stay weird.